LGBT plus rights. So my starting point is to acknowledge the huge positive changes that have been made. Let's not forget that until 1999, Britain had by volume the largest number of anti-LGBT plus laws of any country in the world, some of them dating back centuries. Yet, just 14 years later, with the advent of same-sex marriage in 2013, we had some of the best laws. Now that is an extraordinary achievement. It's unprecedented for any oppressed minority to have so many discriminatory laws removed in such a short space of time. And I want to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to all the many unsung, unknown, LGBT plus grassroots campaigners and our straight friends and allies who made that possible. I think you should all give yourself a big round of applause. So we've made progress, but in recent years that progress has stalled. We have a government in power, has been in power for 14 years, made lots of promises and delivered very little. So way back in July 2018, the Conservative government promised to ban LGBT plus conversion therapy. In other words, the attempt to change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. And they were acting on professional advice from the world's leading medical, psychiatric and counseling organizations which described conversion therapy as harmful, ineffective, and abusive. It doesn't work, but it causes great trauma. The government had a public consultation where the overwhelming majority of people said they agreed the conversion therapy should be banned. We are still waiting six years later. Six years later, despite promises by successive Prime Ministers, we still haven't got a ban on conversion therapy. LGBT plus people are still being subjected to these abusive, harmful, unethical practices. So that's one issue. The second one was that the government had a consultation on easing the process by which trans people could change their legal documents to recognize their true affirmed gender identity. Again, that consultation produced overwhelming support for the trans community, yet the government ignored it. It kicked that consultation into the long grass, and still today, trans people face huge bureaucratic, delayed, prolonged procedures in order to get legal changes. That is not acceptable. And we saw that when the Scottish government very bravely and rightly agreed to allow trans self-ID, the British government used its veto powers to block that. Now what that trans self-ID meant was that trans people could sign a statutory declaration, which is a legal document, which has to be witnessed by a justice of the peace, a solicitor, or someone else of high professional standing. And under the Scottish law, if people made a false declaration, if they declared they were trans but they weren't really, they could face up to two years in prison. So there were very strong safeguards against abuse. But the government and trans critics tried to pretend that trans people under the Scottish law would be able to declare themselves trans on a whim and fancy without any safeguards. We are still in a situation where trans people across the UK do not have a simple system, as exists in many other countries. It's existed, trans self-ID has existed in many other countries for five or more years. There have been no problems. There's been no abuses. It's a system that works and is the right thing to do but the government is still blocking it. And then there is the allied issue of trans healthcare. There's been a war against 
gender identity clinics that support the trans community. Uh, those services have been under attack and indeed have been subjected to all kinds of measures to restrict their activities. Now it's true that a handful, a tiny handful, of people who went through transitioning have had regrets. And I'm very sorry for that. I feel for those people. But on the basis of a tiny minority, the process of allowing trans people to make that transition should not be blocked or restricted. Today, it is typical for a trans person to wait at least five years, more often 10 years, and sometimes 20 or 30 years to get appointments and treatment at a gender identity clinic. That is a form of state-sanctioned abuse. All of this time, they are left in a state of limbo, a state of trauma, they cannot be their true selves. There's got to be proper funding to ensure that trans people can get those appointments and get those treatments. We have to also do more research into the long-term impact of people who transition, the impact of long-term hormone treatment and the impact of various forms of surgery and the drugs involved. I'm fully supportive of trans people who wish to transition but I'm worried that for some people, those treatments may have downsides which have not been properly researched. And that is not a reason to prevent or delay their treatment. It is a reason to fund research to ensure the long-term health of trans people is protected. Now, in the face of these obstacles and delays, my Peter Natural Foundation wrote to the Equalities Minister, Kerry Badnock, back in early January. We asked to have a meeting with her to discuss our concerns. She's the Minister for Equalities. It's her remit to engage with affected communities. But we discovered that she hasn't been engaging. She has met with trans critical groups, but not with trans organisations. She has met with women's rights groups who are against trans people or trans rights, but she hasn't met with the main LGBT lobbying group, Stonewall, for at least two years. Now, what prompted us to write was the fact that last December, in Parliament, Kemi Badnock boasted that she had engaged extensively and widely with LGBT plus organisations. We were furious because that is clearly not true. She's engaged selectively with those organisations that share her particular views, particularly about conversion therapy and about trans rights. So we offered a dialogue, we offered to host a round table meeting where she could sit down with a range of LGBT plus organisations and hear our concerns and hopefully we could find some common ground and move things forward. But Kemi Badenoch wrote to me just over a week ago saying she was not willing to meet. She was not willing to engage. She said, I, words to the effect, I don't want to engage with these groups because they're critical of the government. I mean, it's basically saying, if you don't agree with the government, we're not going to associate with you. That's not a mature, responsible response from a government minister. The purpose is to engage and find the common ground. Um, we're at an impasse right now. Um, Karen Badenoch's office did phone me just a few days ago to say that they were considering that they might meet me personally. Considering that they would meet me personally. I said, okay, we'll send the invitation and I'll consider it. But frankly, I'm not prepared to be singled out as the one person she will meet. Because this is much wider than me and my Peter Natural Foundation. All the affected LGBT plus groups should be in that room speaking to the Minister for Equalities. So let's wait and see what, if anything, they come up with. 
There are other issues, of course, that go beyond immediate government policy. Next Monday, the 11th of March, is Commonwealth Day, the 70th, 5th anniversary of the foundation of the Commonwealth of Nations. 75 years. Do you know that in all those 75 years, the Commonwealth has never once ever even discussed LGBT plus rights? They won't even allow it on the agenda, despite the fact that there are 30 Commonwealth countries that criminalize same-sex relations, in some cases both male and female homosexuality. 30. And of those, several have a maximum penalty of life imprisonment. Life imprisonment for consenting same-sex relations under laws originally imposed by Britain in the 19th century when we were the colonial power. And never repealed since, even though these countries are now independent. This is shocking. This is shocking. And in some of these countries, it's getting worse. So I presume you've all heard about the Anti-Homosexuality Act passed in Uganda last year. This act escalated the penalties for same-sex relations. Under the previous anti-colonial law, there was a maximum penalty of up to life imprisonment. Now the law has been changed to provide a mandatory sentence of life imprisonment. In other words, if you're convicted of a consenting same-sex act, you will be sentenced to imprisonment for life. There's no discretion by the judges. There's no possible lesser sentence. On top of that, organizing, funding, advocating LGBT plus rights has new draconian penalties. So merely advocating LGBT plus equality now carries a maximum sentence of 20 years jail. 20 years jail for simply arguing that LGBT plus people are entitled to respect, dignity, and equal rights. This is shameful, all the more so because Uganda has signed the Commonwealth Charter, which guarantees equal treatment and non-discrimination for all Commonwealth citizens. And Uganda is a member of the Commonwealth, so it applies to Uganda as well. Plus, Uganda's own constitution says, categorically, that everyone is entitled to equal treatment and non-discrimination. So this law is even in violation of Uganda's own constitution. It's also in violation of the African Union's African Charter on human and people's rights, which Uganda has signed and pledged to uphold. So right now, there is a legal case in Uganda to challenge that law. A legal case in the courts to challenge the Anti-Homosexuality Act. By all reason and objective evidence, that case will be won. But as we know, in Uganda, many of the judges have been nobbled by the government. Independent-minded judges are pushed to one side. Those who hear cases are usually stooges of the government. So the big fear is, even though the evidence will show clearly that the Anti-Homosexuality Act is against Uganda's constitution, against the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, against the Commonwealth Charter, the fear is that the judges will uphold uh, that it is constitutional and lawful. One other bizarre thing about this legislation is that it does provide penalties of death by hanging for what it calls aggravated homosexuality. Aggravated homosexuality. And this applies to consenting same-sex relations in certain circumstances. Most notably, most notably, if one or both partners are aged 75 or over. Can you believe it? If one or both partners are aged 75 or older, they will be hanged from the neck until they are dead. If someone has sex with their cousin, for example, they'll be hanged 
from the neck until they're dead. If someone is a repeat offender, i.e. if they have been already convicted once of a same-sex offence, they will automatically be hanged by their neck until they are dead. This is like something straight out of the Taliban. Not something we expect from a Commonwealth country. A Commonwealth country that is funded by Britain, that has diplomatic relations with Britain, and whose leaders come to Britain and take advantage of all our freedoms and rights when they do. Right now, I'm lobbying the Home Secretary, James Cleverly, to ban the Speaker of the, European, of the uh, Ugandan Parliament, Anita Among, from coming to Britain for the Commonwealth 75 celebrations. She has made it clear she intends to come, and she intends to speak out in defence of the Anti-Homosexuality Act, including the right of Uganda to execute LGBT plus people. I've written to the Home Secretary two weeks ago, asking him to ban her on the grounds that her presence is not consistent with British values of tolerance, respect, human rights, dignity, and equality. I haven't had an answer yet. I'm waiting, I'm hoping. Plenty of other people have been banned in the past. Plenty of other foreign leaders and dignitaries have been banned for saying far less controversial or hateful things. But to say that LGBT plus people should be put to death, to defend that, I think that's a red line and she should be banned. My foundation will be working with activists from Commonwealth countries to stage a protest outside Westminster Abbey on Monday, the 11th of March, as the Commonwealth leaders arrive. We'll obviously be targeting those leaders, those leaders of 30 countries where homosexuality is still criminalized. What is shameful is that the Church of England is hosting this event and it's being officially sanctioned by the British government. They are hosting people who want us jailed and in some cases, like Uganda, even killed. Uganda is not the only offender. Just last week, the Ghanaian parliament passed a new draconian anti-homosexuality law, which will criminalise identifying as LGBT+. So just to say that you are gay, lesbian, bisexual, or trans, that will make you a criminal and make you liable to several years imprisonment. Equally, if you advocate for LGBT plus equal rights, you will also be a criminal and subject to prison. That is what is happening in some Commonwealth countries. Not all, but some. And the fact is that right across the Commonwealth, even in most countries that have decriminalized same-sex relations, there is widespread discrimination in housing, employment, education, and healthcare. There's no proper protection against hate crimes and violence. People live in fear, even in these countries where homosexuality per se, between consenting adults, is no longer a crime. So it's a really, really big issue, and as I said, it is so shameful to think that all these 75 years, Commonwealth leaders have vetoed any discussion of LGBT plus human rights. They wouldn't even allow a side event where LGBT plus campaigners from Commonwealth countries could speak about their experiences. To tell the Commonwealth leaders about the real pain and suffering their laws cause. It's obvious why not. Because deep down they know this is deeply embarrassing. That it's shameful, it's bad PR if it's known what they're doing. Another big issue that my foundation is currently working on is to get police chiefs around the country to apologize for their past historic persecution of the LGBT plus community. As you know, there was a partial limited decriminalization of male homosexuality in England and Wales in 1967. 
But in fact, in the years afterwards, the arrests and convictions of gay and bisexual men increased by 400% higher than in the early 1960s before decriminalisation. In 1989, at the peak of the AIDS panic and hysteria, at the peak of the Conservative government's family values and Victorian values campaigns, in 1989, the number of gay and bisexual men arrested for consenting same-sex behaviour was almost as great as in 1954-55, when male homosexuality was totally illegal in all circumstances, and when the country was gripped by a McCarthyite-style anti-gay witch hunt. We wanted the police to apologise, because they weren't simply enforcing the law, they were doing so in a discriminatory manner. So they were raiding bars and clubs and saunas, private birthday parties. They were arresting same-sex couples for merely holding hands in the street or giving each other a goodnight kiss at a bus stop or a railway station. This wasn't enforcing the law. This was enforcing the law with prejudice, interpreting the law in the harshest possible way. And many LGBT plus people were insulted, threatened, and even sometimes violently assaulted by the police. I can remember in the early 1970s at the gay pub, the Colhern, in West London, men would often congregate at closing time on the pavement and just socially chat. The police would turn up and push and shove people. Anybody who arrested, resisted or hesitated for a moment would get arrested and sometimes beaten up. The police got away with it. Because in those days, there was no police watchdog, no police complaints procedure, the police were a law unto themselves. So, we have been striving to get police services around the country to say sorry. And to up their game to provide a better service to the LGBT plus community. So far, 13 out of 45 forces have said sorry. Often backing it up with new commitments to things like appointing an LGBT plus community liaison officer, uh, setting up an LGBT plus staff network for police officers, and creating forums, regular forums, where the LGBT plus community can meet with the police to discuss their concerns. So 13 out of 45, <laughs> do the math, 32 is still to go, and we will keep on pursuing them. The notable exception is being West Midlands Police. West Midlands Police have said no. Categorically, under no circumstances, will they apologise. <coughs> despite the fact that they were the most, or one of the most vicious police forces in the country. They would raid gay bars and clubs, private homes, arrest people for kissing or holding hands in the street. And even worse, they would give the arrested men's names and addresses to the local papers who would then publish them, and their homes would be tapped and they'd be beaten up in the street. This wasn't enforcing the law, this was abusing the law in a way that was homophobic and biphobic. So West Midlands is refusing to apologise. I've said to Birmingham Pride, you should not allow the West Midlands police to march in the Pride Parade. They are an abomination. They are evil. That chief constable, he's an arrogant, uncaring man who doesn't give a damn about the suffering of LGBT plus people by his officers in the past. Any decent chief constable would say sorry. Any chief constable who knew, and we've given them information, who knew what their officers did, would express extreme regret, remorse and sorrow. But the chief constable of West Midlands refuses. He was allowed to march last year against our protestations. He's going to be allowed to march again this year as well. It's an absolute disgrace that Birmingham Pride is giving those officers a platform when they refuse to say sorry. The final point I just want to talk about briefly is the whole issue of trans rights. I fear that we are losing the argument. I fear that the trans critics are increasingly winning. I don't want to exaggerate or 
create unnecessary fear, but I think we do need to recognise there is a shift going on in public opinion which was originally actually quite supportive of the trans community. But the non-stop propaganda and lies of the critics has begun to shift public opinion in the wrong direction. And I think we need to be mindful of that and to recognise we need to perhaps change our tactics. So one of the common cries I hear is trans women are women. I know this is coming from a good place, but it's a bad move which plays into the hands of the trans critics. I say trans women are trans women. They're not the same as other women. They're different. And they have every right to be different. So most women are women based on their biology, in particular their chromosomal sex. Trans women are trans women based on their gender identity. Two different things, equally valid, equally worthy of respect. I just think if we say trans woman or woman, you're just playing into the hands of the trans critics. You're giving them ammunition to undermine the cause. If you make the distinction between biological sex and gender identity and proclaim the equal value of both, it's much more hard, not impossible, but much harder for the critics to get in there. I also think that we need to be really clear that it is absolutely valid that women's rights campaigners want to protect women's safety. We cannot dismiss those concerns as some do. You know, women suffer shocking, suffer shocking misogyny and violence um, throughout their lives. Not all women, of course, but the levels of domestic violence, of rape and sexual assault, physical battery. These are shocking aspects of Britain today in the 21st century. And we have to be very mindful to ensure that women are not exposed to further potential dangers. Now, I do not buy the argument that trans women are a threat to other women. There may be a small number who are, but they are a tiny minority, they're unrepresentative, and you cannot base policy on what a few bad apples do. So, for example, I have a friend who works for a women's centre in the north of England. For seven years, they have accepted trans women in that women's centre with the mutual agreement of the staff and the women users. They've never had a problem. And I think that's very typical. The fear-mongering, the scare-mongering about the threat posed by trans women is out of all proportion. But I agree that all women's organisations should be vetting all women who come into their centres and venues. Because there are some cisgender women, i.e. non-trans women, who are threatening and dangerous because they have a history of violence, they have a history of sexual assaults, they have a history of um, abuse against other women. The idea that all biological women are angels who would never touch anybody and her man, but that's just, that's just fiction. In fact, although the evidence and the figures are not entirely clear, most assaults on women by other women are by non-trans women. The number of trans women who have committed assaults is very, very tiny. Not an excuse. Not a justification, not a matter we can dismiss, but it's very, very tiny. I also agree with the of physical or sexual violence against other women should not be placed in a woman's prison or should be placed in a segregation unit. It is not fair and not right that this handful of tiny minority who have a history of abuse against other women should be put in a general prison population with other women where those other women will feel fearful, they'll feel anxious, which is bad enough, they could also possibly be subjected to physical or sexual assault. Now what I'm saying is, I think we need to make these nuanced responses in order to better defend the rights of trans people, to not give the critics 
the in, the ammunition, the argument, the evidence that they can use to undermine trans rights. And finally, when it comes to sport, I do think there's an issue of fairness. You know, men and women's physiology is different. And trans women who've been through male puberty do in most cases, not all cases, have physiological advantages in terms of bone structure and density, uh, in terms of muscle mass and so on. They do have physical advantages. Not in every case. So I've got a friend. She plays for a women's football team. Uh, she's trans. She's one of the smallest uh, women in the team. She's towered over by some of the cisgender women. The idea that she is giving the team an unfair advantage is nonsense. Quite clearly, she's not. So what I'm saying is, I think when it comes to sport, we need to have individual assessment. I think most trans women, it's okay for them to be in sport. Um, and I'm talking about elite sport, not about general community sport, but elite, elite sport. Um, many trans women, it's fine for them to be in elite competitions in the women's category. But there will be some who have advantages because they've been through male puberty. Because, as we all know, the evidence is very clear that as a general rule, not in every case, but if you go through male puberty, you will have a whole host of physiological advantages over women who haven't experienced that. And we need to be fair in sport. And again, this is about undermining the arguments of the trans critics. They want to ban all trans women. What I'm saying is individual assessment. But what does particularly anger me is why the critics of trans women in sports, they don't have the same criticism of trans men in sports, and they don't make a big issue about other elite athletes who have particular physiological advantages. In most elite sports, there are competitors who have physiological advantages, but no one's suggesting they should be banned. So for example, Michael Phelps, the Olympic swimmer, one of the greatest swimmers of all time, he had clear physiological advantages. He had huge feet, which like, were like, almost like flippers. He had a six foot seven arm span, which gave him huge, huge power. Huge hands, a huge heart, huge lungs. He had massive physiological advantages over other male swimmers. But no one said because of his physiological advantages, he should be banned from swimming, or his gold medal should be taken away. And this, for me, is the problem. It's hypocrisy and double standards to single out trans people. So there's some ideas. You may not agree with them, but these are ideas about where well, I think we, we can more effectively challenge the trans critics. We can more effectively defend the trans community. I think we need to be nuanced. And when it comes to those critics, you know, I do not abuse J.K. Rowling. I don't agree with her, but I, I'm polite, I'm courteous, I explain factually and calmly why I think she's wrong. But I think some of the abuse and threats by some, a tiny minority of trans people, it really undermines the cause. Because those women then use that as a reason to oppose trans rights, and they play up their own victimhood. I've got to say that I'm not even trans. I'm just a trans ally. But every time I speak out on trans rights, on social media, on TV, on radio, I get abuse and threats from people who call themselves feminists. Uh, I've had threats to kill me, to rape me, to castrate me, because I support trans rights. I'm not even trans. My trans friends have had far, far worse. So when the feminists complain that they are being demonized and subjected to abuse, which has happened and is wrong. What they don't acknowledge is the abuse that their friends and supporters are throwing against trans people and trans allies. We need to cool down the debate, make it calm, make our points, make our strong points, be passionate, but be polite, courteous. That's the way to win the arguments. And when it comes to trans critics, my view is generally, don't ban them, protest against them. Show why they're wrong. So when Jermaine Greer 
there were bids to ban her from speaking at Cambridge Union. I said, no, let her speak, but have someone speak against her, protest outside, explain why her views are wrong. Now, I got shouted down by a lot of trans people and other LGBT plus people. They said, no platform for Jermaine Greer. I think that as a community, we have been no platform as LGBTs for decades. We should not resort to those methods. Unless someone is being threatening, uh, advocating violence, or making false damaging allegations. So for example, I'm often accused of being a groomer and a pedophile. That's the way that people try and get to me uh, because they can't deal with my arguments. They haven't got a rational answer for the evidence and arguments I present, so they use these slurs. But I get loads and loads of death threats. And I'm always living in fear that one day, sometime, some unhinged person will actually try to kill me. And trans people have exactly the same thing. You know, they live in fear. A lot of the main trans people will not now do TV and radio. Will not speak at public events because they fear being violently assaulted or even killed. That is profoundly shocking in a supposedly liberal democratic society. So I'll just finish on this point. What is being done to trans people today is what was done, or similar to what was done, to LGB people in the 1970s and 80s. Demonization, vilification, violence and threats. But the LGBT plus community is resilient. We got through that hate campaign in the 1970s and 80s. And we will get through this anti-trans campaign in the 2020s. Hold on to that hope. Make the argument. Defend our trans siblings. We will win.